Phone books to page um, one. <laughs> and when you get there, go ahead and stand, please. <clears throat> All right. Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for what you've given us, the blessings you've bestowed upon us. We thank you, Lord, that we do have the Word of God. And it's full of treasures if we would search for it, for them. In the, in the, and it, it gives us the way of life. It tells us how to live our lives before you. It's, it's pleasing unto you. It tells us how to glorify you in everything we say and do. We ask now that tonight you bless our time together, that you bless uh, the, the teaching of the word of God, and that you would help us, dear Lord, to, to walk a closer walk with you. I think of those who are not here. Maybe some are on the way. Maybe some are unable to come. We ask now for a blessing and comfort those uh, as well who are sick. And we ask uh, you to be with us in a special way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> My hope is in the Lord. Page one. <clears throat> Oh, 
Have your Bibles. 
you turn on to First Peter. First Peter chapter two. We really um I had hoped I was going to be through. Not that it really mattered. I was just thinking, I guess it might be better to say that I was going to be through uh, last week. But I didn't. So first Peter chapter two, look at verse twenty three. We left off in 22, and, and I think the last uh, thing I talked about is I made the statement of, uh, that I read from my devotions that said the flesh must always be sacrificed to the spirit and the heavenly must always be placed before the earthly at any cost. We talked about uh, that being a, a really a, a statement with a lot of gravity. And we also mentioned about uh, the possible, well, whether we... I don't, let's say how I want to say that. I don't really want to say mention. I, I want to say we brought the thought up, I guess, about whether believers today would be willing to make that statement. And we compared it with the, the believers in the past that give their lives. It was such a commitment for them that they were willing to give their lives, understanding that the decisions they made to put the heavenly before the earthly, to put the, the flesh, they sacrificed on the altar to God on, on the needs of, of what God desired, their ministry and, and uh, what was required of them uh, by the Spirit of God if they were to do God's will. They understood their lives would be forfeit. Um, how many would be willing to give that much? And so we, with that said, we go on down to verse 23. Um, Peter is making a progression here, really. Um, and if, let me go back to 20. And it says, For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if ye, when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. And he talks about in 21, For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow. And, and they, he begins to, to make statements here of Christ's suffering. And, 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 and he, he starts off with in 22, who did no sin, neither was there guile found in his mouth. Then he goes on to 23, 24, and 25. Well, actually 23 and 24. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. Uh, but, when he, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. So we have the progression. He says, you know, you're complaining. You're, you're, you're not willing to live for God. You're, 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 you're complaining when they do you wrong and, and you've, or, or they judge you and punish you because of what you've done. He said, but look, this is what happened to Christ. This is what he did. Who when he reviled, when they heaped on him reproach, when he was blasphemed, when the people uh, uh, gave false testimony, when the priests, the religious group of that uh, day, uh, did everything they could, they accused him and, and, and got him to the, the cross so they could crucify his flesh. It says when he was reviled, he reviled not again. All these things that they said, all these things, these false uh, testimonies, what did Christ do? He took it. And he took it patiently. He took it, uh, we would say, well, you know, he took it like a guilty man because the guilty man deserved it, so he'll take it. But even today, they don't, you know. I can remember, um, I won't call him names since we're taping this, but I remember my youth. There was always some that uh, they would be guilty, and pretty much everybody knew it, but the fingers were like, it never pointed at themselves. There's always, it was somebody else. They was always pointing around. So, you know. Everybody got it. But, but Christ did not return the nature of men upon those men. The, the nature of man says, you do me wrong, I'm going to do you wrong. I'm going to get even. Now, I never had that saying in my life. I never said I'd get even. I always said I'd get over. <laughs> that, was, that was my mentality back then. I didn't believe in even. But you know, could not have Christ taken action? Would not he have judged those men? Was he not, would he have not been right if he had of? Oh yes, he would have been righteous. He had uh, the power and he had the position to take any action. But he gave no response. That tells me something. That tells me that, that 
it's not on us to respond. The Bible tells who's who's whose right is it to respond? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But God uh, here, Christ didn't didn't do that. He uh, he didn't take out the. Uh, and I, I I actually want to say, and I'm fighting myself not to say it. Uh, so I'll go ahead and put it out there. He didn't abuse his power, his position, his authority, and take it out. He didn't do that. Um, would have been abuse. Trick question. What was he sent for? What was he supposed to be doing? Well, he did what he's supposed to do. So if he had took it out, it would have been, uh, he would have been going against the, what God had uh, intended. So it would have been in a way, but that's a trick question. Uh, uh, you know, don't hold me responsible for that, and I won't hold you responsible. It wasn't time for him to do it yet. Right. <laughs> it wasn't within the will of God at that time. But it, you can get into a huge debate on that. He was righteous. Un, ungodly men crucified him. But was that within the purpose and plan of God? Sure it was. Because without that happening, where was our redemption? Oh, yeah. Now, if you get too warm, we'll pop that and let the heat escape. Because I know this is a roasty toasty in here. We can bake a turkey in here. So anyway, um, there's definitely a lesson we could stand to learn and apply in our lives in this day and age. Just thinking about what's said here. Um, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. Um, in the South, we say it something like this. Um, they raised my hackles. They said something and got, got my hackles up. Um, the idea that I'm trying to get across is there's so much happening today that does irritate, makes you mad. But the example was given to us to revile not again. Um, I'll just be transparent. There's, there's some things that really irritate me. It really irritate me. I look at some, of, and, and I call my wife attention to some of it, and I won't go into it. Some things that just flat out evil, wickedness, and just it irritates me to no end that uh, there's such an openness to it. I mean, people say, well, you know, that's, that's style, or that's this, or that's that. I, I just, <clears throat> you know what wickedness is? Do you really know what it is? It's disrespect to God. It's a reproach on His name. It's disrespect not only to God, but it's for God. They flaunt it in His face, His creation. Imagine all He's done for the human race. Um, and in a way, in my mind, when I see some of this stuff, it's just spitting back in His face. It's just an open rebuke for what God is and what He uh, desires of us. What He created is, is so vile and so polluted now. He still loves us. And he died for us. But it says, reviled, reviled not again. It says, when he suffered, um, when he had physically placed himself into the hands of those men, they induced, you could call it torture. I don't know that it would actually be torture, but it was, a, it was extreme brutality in the day. The crown of thorns, uh, the, the cross, it was just an extremely brutal way of dying. But, but even before that, they plucked his beard. They, they, uh, the scripture talks about the crown of thorns and, and they beat it on the head. And it's just a, a, the brutality of men. Did he not know that he was going to go through this? Did he not have uh, the ability to speak and rebuke those men? But yet he suffered for us. I don't know, you know, when I'm uh, going through this, and understand, he says, he reviled, reviled not again, he suffered, he threatened not. But he committed himself to who? Committed himself to him that judges righteously. Um, Peter is trying to drive into these people, and I think this is something God wants us to learn. Um, why? Why did he not do this? Because it wasn't God's will for them to do this. He had a purpose and a plan for his life. So we take that, we apply it to our life. Does God have a purpose and plan for your life? Yes or no? Yes. Uh, can you expect to live your life without suffering if Christ suffered and you're going to follow him? 
Would there not be any suffering in your life? Would it not be for a specific reason that God has planned? And is He not in control of it? So should we not do the same thing but commit ourselves to Him that judges righteously? I, he's, he's, he's driving into these people. You know, you can complain about what your life is. You can complain about what you don't have, what you do have. You can make all these excuses up to live the way you want, but that's not what God intended. That's not the example which we're, we're left with. He, and this is the advantage Christ has over us, He knew everything. He knew exactly why He was going through what He's going through. Nobody around Him did. We don't always know why we suffer. We don't always know why we go through what we go through. Um, there were people that I can remember that had um, very serious uh, uh, diseases and, and they were in constant pain. And, and yet when you talk to them, they were just so full of joy and bubbly. And I, I remember one of the, the ladies had a daughter and she said, if you only knew the suffering that she goes through because of that. She said it's 24-7 constant pain. But she had learned to commit that and give it to God. And, and you'd never know it. If, if the daughter had not have told me, I knew there were certain issues, but I had no idea the magnitude of what they were. Um, Christ knew. But we don't always knew. No. Um, I think it would be a good question for us at time to ask ourselves, uh, why is God allowing me to go through this at this time? You know, uh, everybody in here goes through something. I mean, you may be in the midst of a storm right now. You may have just come out of the storm. You may be getting ready to go in. I guarantee it's always one of those. You're either going out, I mean going in, going through, or coming out. There's always something happening in our lives. Some big, some little, but there's always something because God is growing us in Him. Have you ever stopped and asked why or what is the purpose? Now, I'm not saying when I say why, you've got two reasons to ask why. What are they? There's only two reasons you ask why. What are they? Come on, tell me. Rebellion. Curiosity. My dad said I was the why kid. That's how I know this because my dad told me. He said I had to discern whether it was rebellion or curiosity with you. He said you were a curious kid. But um, if that's the two reasons you ask. Why do I have to do this, Lord? That's rebellion. Lord, why do you have me going through this? I wonder what is the better question to ask? What would you like me to learn through it? I think that's the next question <laughs> you need to ask. No, no, you're good. That's good. But we do, because once we figure out, really the why is going to tell us a lot about the what. You know, what would you have me do in this station, what would, in this situation? What would you have me learn? How would you have me to handle this? You know, we know we need to handle it in the spirit of the Lord. We know we not, don't need to be in the flesh. But, in, you know, one of the, the, the hardest thing for me as I try to, to uh, preach and teach uh, the Word of God, and, and as I have people, they come to me and ask me questions, or either I see things in their lives. And, and, and one of the hardest things is to, to have, when they come with me and ask a question, is to have the right answer. Because, you know, I'm just like you. I'm just walking this path, and I'm trying to live as close to God as I can, and I'm trying to do the best I can. And then when I see people with, with things in their life, and I know it's stopping them from growing, do you realize I can't always tell them? Do you understand most times I cannot? Is it my conviction or the Spirit of God's conviction? And so I have to balance that out. Now, now I've kind of made the statement here, if it is a blatant sin in the church, then I'm going to deal with it. But there, most of them are not. Most of them are just not that way. They're, they're, they're personal, they're private. Uh, boy, you just got to like, it makes you pray more. You know, it makes you, Lord, you know, do something in this life. Do something in this life. Um, let me ask you this. Um, why do we go through, why does God allow us to face 
these uh, things at times in our life? Why does he allow that to happen? It draws closer to him. Draws closer to him. I would call that growth, to grow closer to him. So. Burn off some dross. Burn off some dross. <laughs> I have testimony to others. Testimony to others. Okay, I'll read you what I have as the first one. It's an opportunity to glorify God if we handle it correctly. If we don't handle it correctly, uh, our light gets dimmed. You know, you don't light a candle and put it under a basket. You remove that basket so all can see. So as we go through these trials and tribulations or whatever you want to call them, these hardships, we want that candle to burn brightly for Christ. So we want Christ's likeness for everybody to see. So it glorifies Him. So that's for, first and foremost. Um, uh, you mentioned the opportunity of, of drawing closer to God. The, the opportunity to grow. Uh, you know what I found? Um, believers grow best in the midst of trials and tribulations. Let me give you a little secret. <clears throat> I love uh, planting in uh, and, and hydroponics. I did a lot of it uh, on the balcony with tomato plants. Right now I took the, the, the bottom of the celery and grew a little celery and it's rooted now. But I found as long as the water was right there and I kept watering it, uh, the roots didn't go a whole lot. But, uh, and I had it in some water so it wasn't getting a whole lot. So I took that and I, I put it in some, some dirt. And I watered it and kept it wet for a week or so. And then I started letting it dry out. And now the roots are all the way through. See, when, when things get difficult and they get trying, if we're where we're supposed to be and we haven't rejected God and moved off, and we begin to look and search and pray. And I call that putting your roots down into the Word of God. You're searching for a nutrient for your spiritual life that you can't get anywhere else. It has to come out of the Word. This is where it's at. Um, now, we've talked about this back and forth. What happens when some people just seem to fall away? Well, it depends on what God's, what these things that God allows in your life finds in you. You know, one of the purposes of trials is also to reveal to you what's in you. How do you respond? Hopefully, if you respond incorrectly, you'll realize that and say, hey, wait a minute. I'm doing this all wrong. I don't know. Sometimes we're blind to that and we don't see it. And then sometimes we respond correctly. I find I usually respond incorrectly first. Anybody else like that? And then about that time, I catch myself. It's like the pants debacle. When it first happened, I was really aggravated. I was in a crowd of people and and the call come in and, and talk to him. And, and when he said that, <clears throat> I'm coming there. <laughs> and I hung up. And that opportunity to go from where I had the call in that group of people to there, I was able to think it through. No, no. I'm not losing my testimony over this. It's not worth it, you know. And so, yeah, I think we all, that, that human flesh, you know, that, that it comes in, it, it jumps in, and then we have to, to get back and allow the Spirit of God to work. Um, trials can be a time of maturing in the Lord. It gives us an opportunity to grow if we're willing to seize upon that opportunity. If we're willing to, as a child of God, to um, uh, respond or, or, or not respond in the flesh, but just give it over to God. Uh, and that's what, what he's saying here, committing himself, committing it to him that judges rightly. In the end, does it really matter? Let me, let me ask you, if somebody's to cheat you out of millions of dollars, does it really matter when you stand before God in the end? Oh, it's going to sting a little bit now. You know, we may die paupers, but in the end... If you kept your testimony, is it really going to matter? You say, well, that's a lot of money. Well, you got your eyes in the wrong place if that's what you're saying. 
How valuable is that money in compared to a testimony for God? Not at all. Not at all. Um, I've said this one before too, but I'll go back there again. Matthew 16. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Just how important is your soul? How valuable is it? Can you place a value on it? So God came and he gave his life, shed his blood, that he might save your soul. So just how valuable is your testimony for God? You know, we, we, I think we, we have the perspective of the world. We keep thinking of things in, in the world's philosophy, but it's not the way. It's not what, the way we should uh, do. We should begin thinking the way God wants us to do. And what we have to do is begin to learn, if you would, to surrender the flesh and its desires to God. Surrender ourselves and take, take the opportunities God gives us that we might grow. Um, let me... Um, Let's go to Romans, I think. Romans 12. We're, talk, we're talking about the process of growing, surrendering our, 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 our will to God. How does that start? How do you start uh, to surrender your will to God? How does that begin? You've trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. You're, you're a babe in, 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 in Christ. How do you begin to grow? You say, well, okay, you surrender your life to Christ. How do you do that? There's something specifically I think you have to deal with first, and that's pride. Remember, remember where the three sins fall out in? Pride of life, lust of the eyes, and lust of the flesh. I think pride is a big one. You have to get that under control. Is it my life or his? Is it his will or mine? Christ didn't have a problem with pride. He was humble. He said, Lord, Lord, not your will, but mine. What do you want me to do? We don't do that. This is my life, hands off. I'll give you what I want, and that's it. I think we have to start there. I'm not, I'm not taking those other ones, and I'm not trying to uh, downgrade them or, or say they're less or anything, but in my thinking. I go here to... Um, to Romans 12, in, in verse 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a what? Living a living sacrifice. And then he says, that's holy and what? Whoa, acceptable unto God. But then in the end, he puts this little phrase in there, which is in your reasonable service. That right there, is a tremendous verse when you go back and think of what he's teaching in Peter. These people here, they, 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 they're prideful. They, they, you, they're de- de- doing me wrong. You know, they're treating me wrong. I'm, I ought to be treated better. All this thing. He says here, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable. Whoa. We are, this is a, a reasonable service. If you lose your life for Christ's sake, it's reasonable. Now how does he how can he say that? Come on. He says that in light of what God has done for us. Go back to you just hold your, your finger here and you go back into Peter who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judged not, who his own self bear our sins in his own body, right, on the tree, that we being dead in sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed. It's reasonable for us to be willing to sacrifice this life he has given us. It is a reasonable service. It's not outlandish. It's not. Um, it's logical. 
that as a child of God, they'd be willing to give themselves to God. They'd be willing to sacrifice whatever He asked. <clears throat> and then He tells you how in verse 2. Be not conformed to this world. Mm. What does that mean? To not be conformed to this world. The idea it really, <laughs> when it says here, commit himself to him that judges rightly, you cannot uh, be transformed into Christ likeness if you are transforming yourself into worldliness. See, he's telling you there's two separate paths here. When it says here in 12, it says, be not conformed. Don't allow the thinking of this world. Don't allow the principles, the dress, don't allow all these things in this world to become, don't absorb this and that to become you. You have to do the opposite. You have to uh, absorb God's way of thinking, not the world's way of thinking. God's way of dress, not the world's way of, you understand. We transform ourselves. We become more worldly each and every time that we allow the world to impress us. We become more godly each and time. We transform ourselves into Christ's likeness as we put on the Word of God. As we, yeah, Am I getting through there or am I just muddying the waters? Okay. It says, be not conformed, but be transformed. Now, I was using transform. I should have been using conformed. Um, when I went to college, uh, they told me that I had to wear a tie. I did not like wearing the tie, but since I come to college, I signed an agreement. I paid the money, and I said, okay, since I have made the agreement, I'll do what they said. I conform to the rules. If you conform to the rules long enough, it will transform your thinking. God says you got a certain way to dress. He says, you got a certain way to act. Um, you know, my parents, I've said this a million times, my parents, they decided that they were sick of the yeah and the nah and all that, and they said, it's going to be yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am, and they drill that in. Now today, it was conformity before because I would get my, a little switch on me, you know, I'd get tore up before if I got that out when I was a young boy, but now it's ingrained so deep, and you tell me don't do it, it's kind of hard. I mean, I really, I, most times or not, I'm going to fail and say yes, sir, no, sir, anyway. It's just natural. That's the idea. Don't allow yourself to be conformed to this world so long that you become transformed into something that God doesn't want you to. Conform yourself to the Word of God and be transformed, become more Christ-like. And he says this, by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If you're not willing to conform to the Word of God. If you're not willing to allow the Spirit of God to transform you into what God wants, you will never get to that lost part. You will never prove what is good, what is acceptable and perfect will of God. Because you'll never make it there. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, I have that... You kind of beat me to it. Roman. That's fine. I love it. I love when somebody's thinking down the same path I am. If you go into um, Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter, and we're not going to, we're not going to um, stay in here too long uh, because it's the whole chapter really. But if you look in verse 13, it says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. That yielding is a command, both times in 13. Now, why would he command believers to do something if they could not be doing something else? In other words, why does he command us to yield ourselves to God? Well, the truth is, if you don't yield yourself to God, as a child of God, you're yielding yourself to, to sin. So he says, no, you're not to do that. So he commands us to yield your members as instruments. But then go down to 16. His, it says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey? What is he saying? 
As a, and now listen, you can dispute me if you want, but all this is written to believers. He says, you have a choice on where you yield yourself. You're either going to yield it to God or you're going to yield it to the flesh. You're going to yield it to righteousness or you're going to yield it to unrighteousness. You choose. Um, in, in 16, this is also um, uh, um, uh, imperative. Now we have in 9, uh, excuse me, yeah, 16. 16, hold on a second. 16 is an imperative. Then you say, um, I speak. No, I'm wrong. 16 is an error. It's something that happens in the past and has an effect for the future. So whom you yield yourself, whom you have already yielded. If you go back and look at manner in, in 19, we have this in, in, in the past uh, too. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants unto uncleanliness. Past tense. He said, even so now, comparison between what you did before to the flesh, even so now, yield yourselves unto righteousness, unto holiness. Um, you have a choice. We need to take advantage of the choice. The passage of, of Scripture we're looking at in, in Peter in here. Um, you know, go back to Romans. If you're still there, look at uh, verse 12. Nope, that's not the one, is it? Where am I? I'm in the wrong one? Yeah, I'm in the wrong chapter. Yeah, verse 12. It says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Let not. Don't allow these things to happen in your life. You have control. Don't do it. That you should obey the lust of our. Um, don't allow yourselves to conform to what this world says is right. It's what you ought to do. But be transformed according to what God has, would have you do. So, commit yourself unto the righteous judge. Everything that we're looking at really is talking about not allowing uh, sin to reign in our body. Uh, when I look at what's happening in the world today and I see so many that, that really don't understand the truth of what the scripture teaches, even on the basics of salvation. You know, they don't understand what God is telling you about salvation and then your life after. Um, how can we grow spiritually if we're not trying to... I want to use the word demonstrate, but that's really not the, the idea. If we're not willing to to commit our lives to Him, if we're not willing to put and apply what, we, what He's told, taught us or teach us out of the Word of God, if we're not willing to spend time in the Word of God, how can we get to the place God wants us to get? To grow in that relationship with Him, to be the light, if you would. How can we get there if we're not going to spend... Is there, do you know a way? I don't know. I don't see any other way but to spend time with God. Um, it's important and I don't know that, that I can understate the importance of a Christian to grow but the lost need to see how we handle life situation they need to see the difference between uh, those people that uh, do not claim Jesus Christ as Savior and those of us that claim Him they need to see there ought to be a, a tremendous chasm between the two there shouldn't be any closeness at all between how we live our lives. But you know what I'm finding? There is no difference a lot of times anymore. Christians, uh, um, pastors, uh, and I've just mentioned a few uh, thoughts, pastors that drink, pastors that uh, extort money out of the church, pastors that, that uh, fool around in premarital affairs with, with people out of the It's such destructive to the church and to the name of God. It just And people look at that, the lost look at that and say, why should I live any different? What's so great about Christianity? Peter tells us the greatness of it. He, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That's the greatness. God died for us. Um, let me, I want to skip down to 25. 
There, there's basically I've kind of run through everything that was in 24, but uh, before we well we kind of run out of time. But anyway, um, it says, "For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd, bishop of your souls." As I was going through this, something hit me, and I wanted to give that to you tonight as we close this out. Um, there are a number of characteristics about sheep that I found interesting as I was doing some research. Um, and they could be applied in the church as well, I guess. Uh, um, and so I, I, it says, for ye were as sheep going astray. I, I, when I read that, I was thinking about Christians. I was thinking about the sheep. And the first thing I see is, um, or that I read was sheep are gullible. In other words, uh, they're willing to... Um, accept things that they, they keep their head down they just go around eating grass and they don't worry about anything else they're, they're kind of gullible we're not there's no problems here everything's good you know the grass is greener on the other side we'll go ahead and eat and we'll, we'll do what we want and there's no no issues there um they're unable to see the dangers involved in their actions so they stray away from the shepherd they uh, are also timid uh, they panic uh, quickly and they're fearful of things you know, has God ever panicked? <laughs> has God, was, was, let's use the name Christ. Was Christ ever fearful? Was he, was he ever, did he ever panic? Did he ever worry about things? No, he did not. Um, sheep are also, this would be the third one, they're vulnerable to mob mentality. Think about that for a minute. Uh, is that not also our nature as humans? You know, well, everybody else is doing it, you know. You know, uh, I, I tell you what got me when I was thinking about this. Um, you remember when this pandemic hit and everybody panicked? What did they do? Tell me, tell me what they did. They all bought toilet paper. Now, I don't know. Explain to me the superpower of toilet paper, you know. They had such a rush on toilet paper and paper towels, nobody, there wasn't anything available, you know. I mean, everybody just bought it by the caseloads. I mean, and they was willing to fight over it in some of these stores. And I'm thinking, what type of weapon was this, you know, that everybody had to have this stuff by the tons? Some people be using it till the year 2030, you know. Um, it's the panic. It's that mob mentality. Somebody got it, and they're all going after it. Um, it's interesting, you know, when you think about some of the things we do in, in the midst of panic. Um, that mob mentality, what everybody else does, it just begins to drive us. And why we pick it up, I don't know. The next thing is um, the sheep, they have no self-defense. So what happens when you're unable to defend yourself? You find yourself in a situation where you don't have the answer, you can't help yourself, what do you do? Well, you go back to one of the other things you did, you panicked. And then what do you do? You just run around, accomplishing nothing. Have you ever been in a panic and just couldn't get your head together? I have. Trying to figure it all out, and I never did figure it out until I calmed down. And that's what happens. They get into this... This panic and they run around, they become easy targets for those that are seeking to destroy them or would separate them from the herd in order to, to destroy them. And think about that when it comes to the church and, and what we're, we're talking about. It's easy to start a, a, a panic. Oh, you know, I've seen such and such. And, da, 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 and then they divide the church. Now, there's been um, many a church broken over the color of carpet. Man, if you want purple carpet, praise the Lord, it's not going to change my preaching a bit. Okay, I, now, now I see the ladies are like, you better watch it, boy. <laughs> you know? But you understand what I'm saying. In the, end, in the end, it's not going to bother me a bit. I'm still going to preach and teach the way I'm doing it. It's not going to change me. It might hurt my eyes. I might have to wear sunglasses occasionally. But anyway, you know what I'm saying. Um, this destruction of the... The, the, church, the sheep is interesting because we're speaking of the church and believers. We're not speaking spiritual or, excuse me, physical death. We, we're talking about the loss of focus, the loss of, of meaningful purpose, your heart for God. Um, 
when this begins to happen in the church, you have a more of a dead weight on those people. They're, they're more negative than they are a, a blessing to the body of believers. Um, and what happens then is that natural man begins to come out and begin to influence the paths and directions of the church. You've got to re, really be careful. He talks about sheep going astray. How important is it to make sure the sheep are going in the right direction? Well, it's pretty important if God's the shepherd, you know. And we need to be sure that he's always the shepherd. It's not me. It's the word of God and God himself. We need to be sure um, we don't allow the natural man to come to the forefront, to allow the, the jealousy and the competitive nature uh, of people to become uh, foremost in the church. Um, I was thinking about that competitive nature. Anybody ever had chickens? You know, you know what the term is, a pecking order means? We used to have some chickens. We always had um, game chickens or bantams for a while. And it was really bad about the game chickens. You'd throw in five to ten game hens in, the, in, in there, and there would always be one rooster in that pen. And surely enough, one of those hens would have little to no feathers on its back and head. There may be a couple other ones with a few missing. But it always seemed like there was a pecking order. And while that one was on the bottom, everybody pecked on that one and just tore him up. Um, and that's what will happen in a church if you allow that to come to the forefront. It becomes a pecking order. And that's nothing but chaos and, and, and discord, and that's the devil doing his job. You don't want that in there. Even a sheep going astray. We need to be sure that we're not going astray, that we're following after God. Um, and then it says, but now I return to the shepherd and bishop of our souls. Um, we need to be careful that we're not going astray. We need to be careful that uh, uh, we're keeping ourselves where God wants us. Uh, there's some more here. I don't think I'll, I'll go through this now. and We'll start off in three next time. So um, 